morning, everybody. Is the, is the microphone on? I don't know if the microphone's on. There it is. Got it. Hey, good morning. Hey, uh, you probably weren't expecting to see me up here, but that's all right. You know, oh, somebody booed me. <laughs> Sergio, was that you? I bet it was you. Uh, and Carly. Hey, uh, I, I'm thankful to be here. Glad to be with you guys. Uh, we're going to continue in our series, Peace of Mind. And I just got to say, before we do anything else, um, one, our worship team is phenomenal. Can we give them a hand? Um, these guys, these guys uh, work a lot, and they, um, they're all busy. Everybody has busy schedules, but they just devote their time to come up here and just facilitate the heart of worship, and I just love that. It's cool to be able to be on this side of it now where I'm sitting out here in the room and I'm worshiping with my wife and getting ready to have a, have a conversation with you guys, and I get to just worship with the team. It's a beautiful thing, so thank you, worship team. You guys are amazing. Uh, the other thing is... Um, I want to give kind of a uh, preface to our conversation a little bit today. I've had um, a really difficult week. Uh, maybe some of you guys can relate to that. Um, Shelby, I'm sorry, babe. I'm going to call you out. Uh, she's going to kill me after this. Um, but we, uh, my wife had to go into the hospital this week, uh, had a hard time, uh, had some pain, uh, had some kidney, I had a kidney stone that was causing some issues, and so uh, we got three kids, so navigating, I'm, I'm dad, I'm not mom, I'm not superhero, uh, <clears throat> mom is superhero, so when mom is down, the whole family seems to be down, so it's been kind of a difficult week, uh, also prepping for today's message and all that stuff, but I also want to give a shout out, number one, to my wife, because she's amazing, and when she goes down, yeah, go ahead, yep, yep. When she goes down, um, I, get a ch I get a chance to see what her life is like. And so I've had to pick up the slack, and she's amazing. Second, I want to shout out to our Rooted group, our Rooted study. Um, those people have become like family. And uh, Jill, I know you hate this. I'm going to call you out, Jill. Uh, Jill is in, our, is in our group, and she stepped up in a pretty big way this week, helping us with our youngest son, uh, Emerson. And so I just have to say, if you're not in community... Um, I don't know how you go through hardships of life um, because these people have stepped up in a big way and they have been such a blessing to us and our family. So I wanted to say that before we do anything else today. Okay, cool. Um, I was a happy kid. I mean, I had like a great childhood. Um, my parents loved each other. Uh, we went to church uh, all the time. Uh, we went to this small little Methodist church in, uh, in a small town in Oklahoma just right across the border. And my mom taught Sunday school for the kids, uh, which usually was me and my cousins, and that was about it. <laughs> and, uh, and then my grandma played piano at this church, and so you could imagine we were pretty heavily involved uh, in church. Um, also, I went to this really small school, as you can imagine, but my grandparents, kind of a unique thing, my grandparents actually drove the bus for the school district. Uh, from the school that I was in. So I got to see them a whole lot. And not only did my grandpa drive a bus for the school district, he worked as kind of the facilities manager for our, for our school. So like every day I got to see my grandpa, you know, in the lunchroom or passing him in the hallway and I'd stop. He always had these peppermints in his pocket. And I would stop him and go, hey, Pap, Papa, that's what I call him, Pap. Hey, uh, I need a peppermint. So I had a great childhood. I love this. Uh, uh, my childhood was awesome. And uh, my family, particularly my mom's family, uh, was really, really close. And I don't mean like, you know, just a couple of us. I mean like aunts, uncles, cousins, second cousins, third cousins, all, all the above. And we got together a lot. And I don't mean just like on the holidays. We got together every Sunday over at my grandma's house, and we would have breakfast together after church. And it was just a really cool, it was a really cool thing. It was special, and I, was, I feel grateful that I got to... Uh, grow up in a family that did that. I think that's pretty unique in today's culture. But some of you guys have heard the story. Some of you have, some of you know that when uh, when I was 15, my mom was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and then six months later she passed away. And uh, as you can imagine, my entire family was just kind of rocked. I mean, I just illustrated for you how close we were. Um, my world was rocked, as you can imagine. Um, it was pretty difficult. Um, I didn't know fully at that time um, just what that meant, you know, just what that loss would do, like how the family dynamics would change. I didn't know what my future was going to look like. What, is, what does my life look like moving forward? 
And to some degree, when you're 15, you're not thinking about that kind of stuff. Um, you're thinking about, well, I was thinking about girls and sports and weekends, and that was it. Um, I didn't really know what was going to kind of happen and take place. And we've been in this series called Peace of Mind, and we've been talking about different aspects of mental health. And today, we're going to talk about depression. And I'll say this, I don't want to have this conversation. I didn't want to spend time this week uh, and last week writing a, 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 a message or a conversation about depression. I didn't want to dive into my dark moments. I didn't want to remember all those things. I didn't want to, you know, dredge that back up. I didn't want to spend time doing that. And if you're writing a conversation about depression, you kind of have to sit in your depression to be able to do that. So it's been kind of a dark week for me prepping for this. Um, I don't want to have this conversation. And maybe some of you here, maybe listening online, you don't want to have this conversation either. And I just want to say I get it. Um, it's not a fun one to have. But in this series, we're talking about things that don't necessarily get talked about. And I think today's conversation, despite what I want or don't want, is an important one. It's important for us to, to have this conversation. Some of you, as soon as I said depression, you thought, I don't want to talk about sad people and their sadness. And I want to say this, that depression isn't sadness. Um, depression is something totally different. Depression um, is something that you might be struggling with, you're not really aware of, simply because you think, well, I'm not sad. You know, I know what sad feels like. And um, the way I'm feeling is not sad. But depression is not sadness. It's something totally different. I didn't experience depression immediately after my mom passed. I experienced sadness. I experienced loss. I experienced some pain and all those things. But depression just kind of creeped its way into my life. And before long, it just felt like someone had turned the lights out. Um, I'm no expert on this topic. Um, I'm not qualified to tell you the ins and outs of depression and how it works psychologically. Um, I'm just simply here willing to share what I'm learning as a result of my journey and as a result of having some conversation with some people who are a lot smarter than me on this, on this subject. Um, in that time when I lost my mom, everything changed. You know, there were people around that really wanted to help. They, they didn't know what to do. They wanted to help. And I heard a lot of what I now know to be some really kind of unhelpful comments. Um, by show of hands, raise your hand. How many of you know that sometimes church people can say the wrong thing in an effort to do the right thing? Lift up your hand. You, yeah, you've experienced this. Sometimes church people can say the wrong thing in an effort to do the right thing. And for someone who has an experienced depression, you might be a little dismissive, both to battling depression or a person who is battling with depression and you might be a little dismissive of our conversation today you might say things like dude you got so much going on in your life like you know just get over it it's not that bad and I want to remind you that depression is not just sadness it's 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 not just discouragement um, it's constant darkness you know it's sometimes like no feeling at all it's sometimes like no motivation it's sometimes like no hope and what's really sad is that the church should be the safest place to talk about feelings of darkness and depression, and yet it's often not. Like, it's often not a very safe place to have this discussion. Sometimes in faith communities, there's almost this stigma to it where, where someone feels hopeless. They might even feel ashamed, you know, like, I, I, I shouldn't feel the way that I feel. They may feel guilty. Like, spiritually, I must be doing something wrong if I feel this way. And some well-meaning Christians, some people who really want to try to help, might just say, hey, suck it up, you know? Come on, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, pull out of it, you know, get over it. Tell you what, this is, just put your faith in Jesus, and it'll all be okay, you know? And that can kind of be saying the wrong thing in an effort to do the right thing. If someone said to you, I have a sore throat, you might say, hey, you may need to go see a doctor. If somebody said to you, um, somebody broke a bone, you might say, well, you might need to go see a surgeon. But if someone is 
struggling with depression, I think often the implied message in the church is just keep smiling, keep it to yourself, fake it till you make it. And again, I'm just going to say this again. I, you're going to hear me say this a bunch. I'm not an expert on this topic. Um, I, I want to dive into this topic, and the, really the only perspective I can offer is my personal journey and then also what I see in Scripture. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to camp out on some of that a little bit today. I'm no expert, um, but I want to know, what does the Bible have to say about depression? Is there an example in Scripture of depression? And if you're someone who's battling depression today, I want to warn you, uh, you might both identify with, but also get a little frustrated with the verse that I'm going to throw up here in just a minute that we're going to start with today. You might, you might identify with part of it, but you might get a little frustrated by the second part of it. And I want to say, I want to give you context. I think it's important, before we dive into any sort of scripture, to have a plan, to have a purpose, to have an idea. What is it we're trying to go for? And so I want to throw this verse up here because I want to give you some context for why we're having the conversation and what it is we hope to get from this conversation. So I want to throw this up there. Proverbs 12, 25 says, anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. Yeah, no duh, right? Um, it's kind of like a no-brainer. Anxiety, fear, worry, stress. That causes depression. It's pretty easy to identify with that. But how about this next part of it? But a good word makes it glad. Anxiety causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. If you're battling with depression... You may say, dude, it is not that simple. <laughs> and I get it. It's not that simple. A good word, are you kidding me? A good word doesn't pull me out of my darkness. But I want to remind you that it's not about what I'm saying today. It's not about the conversation we have today. It's about the inspired truth of God. It's about God's word. When we're talking about a good word makes it glad, we're talking about straight from God. His inspired word, it makes it glad. And that may feel a little too simplistic. And if it does feel a little too simplistic to you, I pray that today, uh, by the power of not what I'm saying, but by the power of the word of God, you can receive maybe just a little bit of hope and a little bit of healing. Cool? Can we pray together before we move on? Father, I pray that today's conversation is one that... Um, transcends our own understanding i pray that today's conversation would light up some darkness for those who are surrounded in the battle against depression i pray that you would speak father in spite of me i pray that today uh, this conversation would be at worst helpful and at best it would be healing i pray this in your name and everyone said Amen. okay feels pretty heavy right sorry i hope that today's conversation is not going to be a depressing conversation but the reality of it is, depression is a very complex issue. And in case you're sitting in the room going, ah, I don't know if today really applies to me. Maybe you're feeling proud, you don't struggle with depression. I want to say, don't feel proud. Because depression does not discriminate. It does not care who you are, what your circumstances are. It doesn't care what your status is. It can attack anybody at any time. It really just doesn't care. And another thing I want to say, too, is I want to acknowledge this up front. Uh, just because I struggled and have battled with depression does not mean that it's a one-size-fits-all issue. So, like, my depression, that what I have battled with, doesn't necessarily look like what somebody else is going through or has gone through. It's, 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 not, it's not a one-size-fits-all thing. It's multifaceted. It's a very complex issue. According to ex experts, there's um, essentially four root causes of depression— one is biological causes. So the first is a biological cause. If you're battling with depression, you may not have done anything wrong whatsoever in your life. You may actually just have a chemical imbalance in your body or your brain that's causing you to feel the way you feel. Um, you might have a nutritional deficit. You might have a, so maybe some hormonal changes. You see this a lot with postpartum depression in women. And if you're, it's a very real thing. I want to say that if you're someone who is struggling with that, you can talk to my wife. She has a lot of experience with that. This is real. And honestly, it can be a little scary. Um, I'm sure Shelby would love to talk at any, with anybody about her experience with that. 
You might not be sleeping enough or exercising enough or getting enough sunlight. There are biological causes to depression. There's also what we might call relational causes. Like in other words, you might have a really big problem with one of your kids. Maybe struggling with that. You might have like maybe a life-threatening issue that's kind of weighing on you. Your marriage might be struggling. Um, you may have issues with somebody that you love. You're going, maybe you're going through a divorce. That's really hard. Or you've been rejected. Or I don't know, maybe you've gone through like a global pandemic for the last two years. And you've isolated yourself. And you've not had relationship with people. And you're kind of going, why do I feel so dark? Why does this feel so heavy? There might be some relational stuff at the root of depression. The third is you could have some circumstantial causes. So at the root of your depression, you might be like me. Maybe you've lost somebody that you love, um, and you're kind of dealing with feelings of darkness because of this. You wish you could talk to them one more time. You wish you could call and ask for advice or call and celebrate an achievement. You might have gone through some kind of trauma. Last week we talked about trauma, the effects of trauma on our body. Maybe financially you've done everything you possibly could to hold it all together, and you still ended up filing for bankruptcy. Your situation may have changed. Maybe you've shifted jobs, or maybe you've been laid off, and you're having a little bit of an identity issue. Could be circumstances at the root of your depression. It could be biological, could be relational, could be circumstantial, but I also think we have to, we have to acknowledge this. Um, your depression could stem from some very real spiritual attacks. We have to remember, we don't battle against one another, against flesh and blood, maybe is the common phrase that you've heard. We have very real battles against an enemy, the forces of darkness that want to steal, kill, and destroy everything that matters to God. And whether you believe it or not, there's nothing that matters more to God than you. And your enemy knows that. And he's after you. So there are several things that can be the root of our depression. And again, I'll remind you, not speaking as an authority on mental health. I feel like I need to say that a, b- a bunch of times. There's, I, there's so many people out there that's much smarter than me on this topic. I just want to share what I'm learning and what I'm discovering with it all. Um, I'm speaking as a person who loves Jesus, and I want to know more about what Scripture has to say about this. And um, at any point in today's conversation that you, you, you can just jump over, maybe you're wrestling with something or maybe God's put a thought in your mind, you can jump over to a website that we've created. Um, you can jump over to colonialchurch.com slash mental health. You could literally do that right now and you're not going to offend me. You could do that at any point in time in this conversation. Go jump over there. It's got some resources there. It's got all of our previous teachings on this series. It's even got a list of places to contact for some good counseling. I would strongly recommend that you head over to that website, check it out, peruse, kind of go through some of that. It would be really good for you to do. I want to take us to the Old Testament where we can look at the life of a depressed man. I talked about where, where in Scripture do we have this example? Something we should know about the man that we're going to ta- kind of take a look at is he was a prophet, okay? That basically means he spoke on behalf of God. Um, He represented God. He told people what God told him to say. And yet, this man of God, this person of deep, committed, deeply rooted faith, really struggled with depression. And he was in a desperate and dark place. We're going to talk about the prophet Jeremiah, Lamentations 3. And I want to give you a little bit of context for why he might have experienced some depression. Solomon's temple was one of the greatest tributes to God in the history of mankind, okay? So it stood like for 400 years before it was destroyed by the Babylonians in 587 B.C. And Jeremiah saw the destruction of this temple. Um, There was this like battle that was happening, okay? He would have witnessed loved ones being murdered. He would have witnessed his friends being carted away, taken captive. He would have watched his city, his home, this house of worship to God be destroyed. He saw all of this up close and personal. And as you can imagine, he was depressed. And like some of us who are battling depression or wrestling with depression, he didn't know where to turn. And so as we read this passage, I want you to watch some descriptions here of a man of God who just for a moment found himself without any hope. Um, If you've ever battled, if you've never battled with depression, I would say this. This is a very accurate description of what it feels like to battle through depression, to wrestle through depression. We're going to start in Lamentations 3, verse 1. 
He says, I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. And then moving down a little further into verse 5. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. He has walled me in so that I cannot escape. He's weighed me down with chains. Even when I call out and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. This guy is hurting. Later in verse 17, he says this. I've been deprived of peace. I've forgotten what prosperity is. So I say my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. My soul is downcast within me. This, this man is depressed. Another version of that last phrase, that last statement there, verse 20, says, This is all I ever think about, and I am depressed. This prophet, this man of God, feels no hope. There's two truths to remember when you're battling depression. The first one is that your emotions are valid. I think a lot of times in church culture, people say it doesn't matter what your feelings are. Don't believe your feelings, don't trust your feelings, don't pay attention to your feelings. But the reality is that your emotions are valid. And I'll say this, I have been guilty of saying the same thing. Don't trust your feelings, you know. When God made you, he placed all of these things in you. He placed them all within you. He made us in his image, including our emotions, including our feelings. How you feel is valid and should never be dismissed. The second truth is that your situation feels hopeless. Your situation feels hopeless. If you're depressed, you don't know what to do. You don't know where to turn. You don't know how to get out. You may have tried to pray. You've tried to read your Bible. And you've tried really hard to believe. And you, maybe you've done this for a long time. And now you find yourself with no hope. What we've just said about these two things are absolutely true. But they're incomplete. Yes, your emotions are valid. Yes, your situation feels hopeless, but so many times we get stuck on what is true, but what is also incomplete. We get stuck on what's true. There is truth in this, that your emotions are valid, your situation feels hopeless, but it's an incomplete truth. You really do feel the way that you feel. They're valid. Some of us need to hear that today. You need permission to feel the way that you feel. Some of you need to be validated in that. Hey, I actually feel this way. But you also need to hear that they're not permanent. Your emotions are valid, but they aren't permanent. Feelings are real, but fleeting. Happiness can be short-lived. Fear can be short-lived. Anger can be short-lived. And yes, even sorrow can be short-lived. Your emotions are valid, they're not permanent. And the reality is that your situation may feel hopeless, but with God there is always hope. We're going to unpack this just a little bit. When you're hurt, when you don't know where to turn, when you feel like you've done it all, you can't get out, I want to say that your emotions are valid. They're valid, they're real, and they're actually an important part of your healing. These emotions are an important part of your healing. An expert would say that one of the ways to heal and actually begin to change the way that you feel is to start acknowledging, literally naming how you feel, like naming your emotions. If you're feeling hopeless, acknowledge or name that you're feeling that way. You might be angry. You might feel hurt. You might feel frustrated with the world and the way the world is going. You might feel betrayed. And if you're depressed, you might say, I feel empty or I feel numb. Name your feelings. If you're feeling afraid, say, I feel afraid. Okay, how many of you are afraid of spiders? Raise your hands. Afraid of spiders? Me too. There's no point in that. I just wanted to ask. No. <laughs> There's a study that was done with spiders. Okay, well, not really spiders, like house spiders. They did this study with tarantulas, okay? And here's what they did. They took a group of people who were afraid of spiders and they exposed them to a tarantula in a cage. Okay, I don't know why they would do this to these poor people. Okay, but they got them in a room. There's a tarantula in the room. They, it was in the cage. They exposed them 
And they, then after they had that experience together, they split them up into four groups, and they gave them four different assignments, okay? They told the first group uh, to name what you're feeling, right? So in other words, uh, I feel afraid of hairy spiders. That'd be a good one. All right, so label what you're feeling, name what you're feeling. The second group, they said, make observations, you know, like what's, what's going on in the room, you know? Um, like maybe say... I feel afraid of hairy spiders, or that tarantula is in a cage, that tarantula is big. Like, make an observation about what's happening. To the third group, they just said, say something irrelevant, like, I don't know, it's Tuesday or it's about to rain, okay? Like, really kind of don't acknowledge it. Something irrelevant distract you from what's happening. And then to the fourth group, they said, just don't say anything at all. Don't, don't mention it, don't say anything. Okay, so these different assignments were label what you're feeling, Make observations, say something irrelevant, and then don't say anything, okay? Then they brought these people back a week later. Man, they're just really giving it to these people. They brought these people back a week later. They exposed them to the tarantula again, but only this time it wasn't in the cage. Yeah, exactly. And when they went in, they measured, like, what's their physiological response? Like, what's their body doing? Did they sweat? Did their heart rate speed up? Did they pee their pants? Like, what did they do? Right? They're, taking, they're just taking it all in. What, what, what are these people doing? And what they discovered is out of the four groups, the one that actually labeled their feelings the week previously did exceptionally better. Um, they were less nervous, and actually many of them were actually able to hold the tarantula in their hand. Mm -hmm. And what they learned from this and some other studies is that naming your emotions opens the door to changing your emotions. Naming your emotions opens the door to changing your emotions. And I want to say this as well. Some of us might be angry, and we're refusing to name that we're angry. Like, you might have some anger that's fueling how you respond and react to people around you, and you've not named the fact, hey, I've got some anger that I need to deal with. Some of us might be making decisions in our life based off fear and worry and anxiety, and we think the rest of the world just must be like us. This is just life. Everybody's fearful. Everybody's worried. Everybody's anxious. We need to name our emotions. It's not super spiritual or anything like that to just pretend like our emotions and feelings don't exist. They're there. I'll remind you, God gave them to us. They're a gift from God. They're real. They're valid. But they aren't permanent. And when we can recognize that our feelings aren't permanent... We can identify them. I feel alone. I feel desperate. I feel hopeless. When we can name what it is that we're feeling, that actually opens the door to God being able to change it. And because of our emotions, uh, because that our, our emotions are temporary, I want to say this. We're not going to make permanent decisions based on temporary emotions. We're not going to make permanent decisions based on temporary emotions. When you're feeling down, we're not going to make a permanent decision based on that. And not only are we not going to make permanent decisions, we're not going to draw permanent conclusions based on that either. Like, like, like when you're feeling, okay, well, all men must be this way. Or all people are divisive and that way. Or every church is just full of hypocrites. No, we're not, we're not going to draw permanent conclusions based on temporary emotions. Like when you feel afraid or you feel threatened, you might be tempted to quit on your marriage. You might feel like quitting on God. You might feel like running out the door, isolating yourself, shutting the world out. Some of you might feel like going and grabbing your favorite bottle of whiskey and drinking your worries away. We're not going to make permanent decisions and permanent conclusions based on temporary emotions. Some of you may feel like life isn't worth it. And your spiritual enemy, again, I'll remind you, who wants to steal, kill, and destroy, he wants to whisper lies into your ear like, it'd be better off if you weren't here. And in the moment, that might feel like truth. But I want you to hear me say this. That is never, ever, 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 ever under any circumstances true. Because God knew who you were going to be. He created you. He formed you. He knew who you were before you were in your mother's womb. He, has, he put you here on earth to know you, 
He's got good works that he's put out for you to do. He has a purpose. He has a plan for you. No matter what lies the enemy wants to tell you, when you find yourself in this, I want you to remind yourself God has a purpose. You, your family, your community, your church, your world are better off with you here. Period. There is no but after that. We're better off with you here. We're not going to make permanent decisions or conclusions based on temporary emotions. Yes, your emotions are valid. God gave them to you. We're going to feel them, but we're not going to be ruled by our emotions. And just like we said earlier, your situation may feel hopeless, but with God, there's always hope. You may not feel it. You may not even believe it. But the truth is that God can always give you hope. And I want to show you this in Lamentations 3. Remember in verse 20, Jeremiah said, my soul is downcast. But I want to know, does Jeremiah stay there? What happens after this? In verse 21, he continues and he says, yet I call this to mind and therefore I have hope. He's saying, I feel hopeless, I feel depressed, I'm walking in darkness, I have no hope whatsoever, yet I call this to mind. And because I call this to mind, I have hope. In the middle of his darkest moments, he begins to call to his mind the goodness, the character, the nature, the heart of God. He begins to remind himself, and he talks about it like this in verse 22. He says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They're new every morning, and then he says... Great is your faithfulness. Are you kidding? In the middle of all this, all the loss, the pain, everything he suffered, his family is gone, his friends are gone, his city is gone, his house of worship, his place of worship where he, is, he has gotten closer to God is gone. It's all in ruins. And then he declares, God, great is your faithfulness. I call this to mind. Because of the Lord's great love, we're not consumed. Because of his love. Because of his love. I want to camp here for a second. I'm going to throw a a few words out here, and I'm probably going to butcher this, but it's okay. I'm going to take the risk with you, okay? The word love in the Hebrew text is the plural form of the word hesed, which is a very powerful word, and it's difficult to translate, okay? It's in the Bible 248 times, and it's packed with meaning. Would you just say this with me, hesed? Hesed. Many Hebrew words are more like a sentence rather than like, you know, a word, It's almost like a mini story, okay? Um, And so it's really hard to translate them because it's just packed full of meaning. It's really hard to translate into English. The word has said translators like to say like loving kindness or like mercy or loyalty. But the word's kind of impossible to describe apart from um, the fullness of God's character. So there's two definitions really that stand out to me. And one is the word has said means the unbreakable devotions to God's promises. The unbreakable devotions of God's promises. I really like that one. Another one is, has said means a covenantal commitment to God's character. A covenantal commitment to God's character. That's has said. That's what we're talking about when it says love here. Because of his love, we are not consumed and his compassions never fail. All right, there's this word compassions here. I want to throw another Hebrew word out there for you. The word compassions is translated from the Hebrew word rachamim. Okay, not the very same word, the very same root word, okay? It's the very same root word for compassions. Is compassions is like mercy, uh, compassion, womb. So it's the very same root word that you see for womb, like the mother's womb. So check this out. What happens in the womb? Well, the womb is a safe place. The womb is a sanctuary where life begins. In the womb, life is nourished and is strengthened and is protected. And it's in this womb that the compassions of the Lord never fail. They're new every morning. The grace of God is new every morning. His presence is new every morning. The grace of God, again, is new every morning. It gives you, he gives you enough every morning. He gives you daily bread, daily grace, daily compassion, daily goodness. With God, there's always hope. That's what he's talking about here when he says compassions. So what do we do when the world feels dark? Well, we acknowledge it, okay? We call it what it is. And then we can also acknowledge that we need help. This right here, your community, people that you find yourself, your, your, your spiritual family, this is a safe place for you to admit and to say, hey, I need some help. And I want to say this as well. Asking for help is not a sign of weakness. 
It's a sign of wisdom. Asking for help is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of wisdom. What steps can we take? Say, I, I need some help. Well, then get some help. Ask for help. What steps can we take? Well, you could talk to a counselor. That's a wise thing to do. You could see a doctor that might be able to prescribe you some medicine that would help. That's wise. That's not unspiritual. I take medication for some things that I'm dealing with and battling with as well. It's not unspiritual to say, hey, doc, I need some help. Something's not right. I need some help. You might change your diet. That's wise and spiritual. It's not something I do all the time. But you might change your diet. That's wise and spiritual. It works with the way that God made you and designed you. You might start exercising or journal or, or figure out how to get in a group and journey with people who can lift you up when you can't stand on your own. Again, I'll say this. I don't know how people can go through hard things in life, let alone good things in life, without community, without a spiritual family, people who can lift you up out of the darkness. I don't know how people deal with hard stuff in their life without people encouraging them and pointing them to Jesus. People who remind them of the goodness of God when they forget. And again, I'm not talking about friends who hang out on the weekend. I'm talking about spiritual family. What steps can we take? You might pray. You might pause. You might do what we did earlier. You might praise. I call this to mind. I call this to mind. And when you do these different things, you know what happens? You begin to change your posture. When you pray, when you pause, when you praise, you begin to lift yourself. You begin to change your posture. And when you talk to someone who's depressed, is there, are their shoulders down or are they up? No, they're down. Is their voice loud and confident or is it quiet and in darkness? Are they smiling? Or are they frowning? Their posture's down. Now, there's no way of proving this, but I can imagine that when Jeremiah said, I'm in darkness, my soul was downcast, his posture was down. And then he said, I call this to mind. And his posture began to change. Our posture reflects our mood, but it can also impact our mood. And I would say, maybe he looked up and he raised up his hands towards heaven. You know, anytime you raise your hands towards heaven, um, this is a posture of surrender. And what do you do if someone holds a gun to you? Oh, I surrender, right? Or I think of like times when my kids come running up to me and they're hurt and they need me and they want, it's, it's like a sign of dad, hold me. I want you to hold me. When we raise our hands towards heaven, we're saying, I surrender. God, hold me. I want to be near you. Take this for me. I need help. I can't do this on my own. Sometimes we're raising our hands as a sign of victory, right? Our team has won. We scored a touchdown. We hit a home run. Or I think sometimes raising our hands is like this picture. A couple years ago, some really good friends gifted Shelby and I a stay in Colorado and, um, we stopped at a place called the Garden of the Gods in Colorado. Anybody familiar with Garden of the Gods? Ah, oh, beautiful place. Take me back there, Lord. Beautiful place. And I love this. Um, this is my son, Easton. We're in this amazing place. I can't even describe to you how beautiful this place is. And he climbs up on this rock, and then he just does this. And I just think, oh, my gosh, what a beautiful sign of worship and just surrender to what God's got going on. Sometimes this is what happens when we raise our hands. I thought, what an amazing moment of worship here. When you surrender to God, you find victory. And what Jeremiah is saying here when he says, I, yet I call this to mind, he's saying, I say to myself, I call this back up to my mind. I choose to remember. He's preaching to himself. You know, sometimes we've got to preach to ourselves. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves. This is what Jeremiah is doing. In Lamentations 3, 24, he says, the Lord is my portion Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. And then he says to himself, the Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. And then he says, it's good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Sometimes you have to preach to yourself. Why so downcast, O oh my soul? I'm sorry, that's scary, man. I don't know what just happened, but... 
I'm telling the Lord, why? Why so downcast? Maybe I won't bend down like that again. I don't know how you get back on track after that, you know? Sometimes you have to preach to yourself. That's where we're going to start. Why so downcast, oh my soul? you got to say this to yourself, yet I call this to mind. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know, I don't know what you might say to yourself. But I might, say, I might say to myself, God, you're a perfect father, never failing your children. You're with me in times of trouble and hardship. You comfort me and you guide me into your joy. Oh, I need some joy in my life. You're my rest when I'm weary. Your strength and weakness, your home, your shelter from the storm. I may remind myself of this. What is it that you would tell yourself? Sometimes we need to preach to ourselves. This is what we see Jeremiah doing. Will that solve everything? I don't know. It certainly can't hurt, though. It certainly can't hurt. Sometimes we need to renew our mind. That comes from preaching to ourselves, reminding ourselves. Sometimes we need to correct our body. Remember I said it's a complex issue. Maybe we need to do some things. We need to get out and have sunlight. I'm so, I'm gun shy now, man. Whew. Maybe that was not a good terminology to use. I don't know. It's a complex issue. Depression's a complex issue. We're not going to belittle it, but we're definitely not going to surrender to it. We surrender to God and only God. We fight, we trust that God has a purpose for us, we worship God, and when we worship God, our, our perspective begins to shift. We begin to see our circumstances and ourselves a little bit differently. We stop thinking about ourselves, and we start thinking about God. It helps, trust me. Golly, man. <laughs> when we worship we stop thinking about ourselves all the attention goes away from us and it goes to where god trust me this this happens try staying angry at someone when you're worshiping the lord it is really difficult to do can you do it well i would argue if you're really staying mad at that person worshiping maybe you're not worshiping it's really difficult to do you can't stay mad at someone while worshiping the Lord, it takes all of our attention off of ourselves and puts it on God, right where it's supposed to be. We fight, we trust, we worship, we preach to ourselves. Maybe for some of you, this is too simple, and I get it, but maybe it's exactly what some of us need to make it through the next day, make it through the next hour, and for some of us, to make it through the next minute. If you're struggling with depression, I, I don't want to just have a conversation about depression to stir up things and not point you somewhere. If you're struggling with depression and you want to hear more about it, I would encourage you to check out tomorrow's podcast. Check out our E6 podcast. We're going to talk more about my journey. We didn't get into depth. We didn't talk really much about my experience with, journey, with, with, with depression. We're going to talk about that on our podcast. We've got another interview that we're going to share with a trained, knowledgeable therapist, a person that is a Bible scholar. He loves Jesus. He loves people, and he wants to help. So if you're struggling with depression, I want to point you there. I also want to point you back to our Colonial Church um, slash mental health page. Charles Spurgeon was a pastor and author from the 1800s. He was commonly referred to as the Prince of Preachers. you got to be pretty awesome to be referred to as the Prince of Preachers. And he had this to say about depression. I know perhaps as well as anyone what depression means and what it is to feel myself sinking lower and lower. Yet at the worst, when I reach the lowest depths, I have an inward peace which no pain or depression can in the least disturb. Trusting in Jesus Christ, my Savior, there is a blessed quietness in the deep caverns of my soul. Now, I'll tell you, my battle with depression isn't over. I told you before, I take medicine to help my mind heal. I have to remind myself that how I feel in the moment is temporary. I have to remind myself and surround myself with the goodness of God. And honestly, I depend on good, amazing friendships with people who love me when I can't love myself. People who remind me of my calling and of my purpose. Fight and take the necessary steps. Find a counselor. 
talk to a trusted friend, call that doctor, jump into some community. If you're here and you're like, I don't think I know anybody in this room, that's a red flag. Jump in, find some community. I don't know what it's going to take. I don't know what it's going to take. How many times we're going to have to encourage you to do this? Jump into community. You're missing out on what God wants you to have if you're not in community. Thank you. That's all right. I'll just take it off. Yeah. Hey. Whew. My goodness. Still a little jumpy, though. It's all right. Like I said, my, depre- my, my, my journey, my battle with depression is not over by, by a long shot. I wrestle with this every single day. I battle with this every day. But I'm not going to surrender to my feelings, right? I have a good woman who is my, who is my partner in ministry, partner in, in life. She encourages me. She strengthens me. She challenges me sometimes more than I want her to. I've got people around me. I'm telling you, I've got people of peace around me who love me, who want to pour into me, who want to see God's best for me, who fight for my highest possible good. This is what it takes to battle with depression and to overcome those things. And I would say this. Maybe some of you haven't really ever surrendered to God. Well, you don't really have this hope that Jeremiah is talking about, okay? Maybe some of you haven't surrendered to God and he's calling you to do so right now. You're feeling like right now is the time where he's stirring in you I think I need to come and surrender to him. I, my, my posture needs to be like this. I want to see victory. I want to see victory. I want to experience worship and communion with God. You've tried it your way, and now you're ready to surrender to him. We're going to have a response team down here in just a minute. And I want you to, I want you to come talk to him. I, don't, don't let, this is, this is the worst thing that I think can happen on a Sunday when we gather together. Is for God to stir up something within our soul and then for us to walk out of here carrying it. Come down, have a conversation. When God stirs up something in us and he encourages us in the context of a gathering on Sunday, we need to have a conversation. We need to carry that with us. Reach out to one of our pastors here at Colonial. Call a counselor. Have a necessary conversation. You know, reach out to a doctor who can help. Get in community with people who will be real and will be vulnerable, who will challenge you and who's not afraid to tell you the truth and things that you don't necessarily want to hear, and they will strengthen you. Your emotions are valid, but they're not permanent, and your situation feels hopeless, but with God, there's always hope. Would you stand up with me? Would you stand? Our response team's going to come down front. And as they do that, I want to say this. If you're scheduled to be baptized today, would you just make your way over here to the door on your right? Right back over here. We've got, yes, we have baptisms today. I'm excited for this. Yes. <laughs> Told you what, man. We can talk about depression without being depressed. We can, we can celebrate what God is doing. Let's pray together. Father, we are just so thankful for who you are, that in spite of, who, of, of what we wrestle with, in spite of our battles, Lord, we know that we can come to you, that, that you've given us these emotions and these feelings, and in some ways it's, it's designed to spur us on, to encourage us. And Lord, we know that if we find ourselves battling with depression, these feelings of hurt or fear or anxiety or anger, we know that these things are temporary. Father, would you help us not to make permanent decisions and conclusions based off of that? That we would, we would strengthen our relationship with you. We would, we would choose, that, to be, choose to believe that even though our situation feels hopeless, with you there is hope. Father, we pray that as, as we had this conversation today, if you stirred it up in anyone, maybe to surrender to you for the first time. Lord, I pray that they would walk down front, they would have a conversation with this response team that's here and ready to have this conversation with them. Father, we love you. We submit ourselves to you. We submit our battles to you. And we know that you can guide us into all truth and into all joy. Father, we love you. We thank you. It's you and we pray. And everyone said, amen. Hey, before you leave, before you kind of rustle around, I want to say this. Hang tight, okay, because we've got something kind of special we want to do today, okay? We have an amazing moment to celebrate. We've got some baptisms we've got. We've got several people. So here's what I want you to do. Here's some instructions. Uh, First, I want to say, if you've got questions, if this has stirred up anything within you, there's a couple of ways that you can respond. You can fill out, uh, go to the connection page. You can also ask a a question for our podcast, submit it to E6, and we will get to it tomorrow. We'll have that discussion.
discussion. We'll have that conversation. Also, there's some weekly discussion questions that are going to come out to you here in just a moment. Wrestle with that. Talk through some of those things. Those are some ways we want you to respond if God's stirring in you. Um, but also, here's what I want you to do. We, we need to celebrate some life change that's happening, okay? And so if you've got kids over in kids' ministry, we want you to go grab them out of kids' ministry, bring them back into the cafe. We've got baptism set up right in the cafe. We're going to celebrate the heck out of some life change. We've got several people scheduled to be baptized today. This is a party, all right? We've had a conversation today about a heavy topic, but we're going to celebrate what God's doing in people's lives. Amen? Amen. All right. Thank you guys so much. God bless you. We'll see you in the cafe.